Described by the Los Angeles Times as one of Iran's most potent voices in exile, Suzanne Daim is a composer, vocalist, and performance artist. In 1976, she left Iran as a ballet dancer to enter the ballet of the 20th century in Brussels. And in 1980, she moved to New York, embarking on a multifaceted career encompassing music, theater, dance, media, and film. Her work has been presented at the Carnegie Hall, Royce Hall, the Wallace, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Some of Susan's, Suzanne's wide-ranging collaborations include Peter Gabriel, U2, Bobby McFerrin, Eve Ensler, Shirin Nishat, and her longtime partner, film, uh, film composer Richard Horvitz. She can be heard on the soundtrack of the Oscar-winning Argo, The Last Temptation of Christ, and The Kite Runner, among others. Please help me welcome to the stage Suzanne Dayim. Where did Suzanne go? She'll be here shortly. OK, in the meantime, Ahmad Karimi Hakak is an emeritus professor of Persian language, literature, and culture at the University of Maryland and is now an adjunct professor at UCLA's Department of Near Eastern Languages and Cultures. He's the author, translator, or editor of 24 books and over 100 academic articles, and he has contributed to various encyclopedias such as Britannica and Iranica. His works have been translated into many languages, and the Persian translation of one of his most important books, titled Recasting Persian Poetry, is the standard textbook for PhD programs in Persian literature in Iran, Indian, Afghan, and Tajik universities. Please help me welcome to the stage Professor Karimi Hakak. Well, we have had, um, thank you first of all for both of you being here. Um, we have had several hours of conversations over the last several months putting this program together, which we now have to compress down to about 30 minutes. <laughs> we'll do the best we can. I think the best place to start would probably be just with a little background. I was someone who came to Farouk Farksad's poetry through Houses Black. I saw the film on a VHS copy years and years and years ago. I've never seen it as good as I saw it today, as clear, as sharp. It's, it's an extraordinary restoration. But let's get some background on her career. She had already, by the time she made this film, rocked the Iranian literary scene with several works of poetry. Can you sort of set the scene for her career and life leading up to the making of uh, House is Black for us? Sure, I'll be happy to. Uh, well, in her case, we have a uh, lively imagination growing up somewhere in Tehran, born into a family of uh, high-ranking military officials. Uh, probably in the family there was some violence, physical violence, uh, which made of her a reticent girl, which internalized every experience. In fact, I would dare to say that she had more experiences imagined than actually gone through. And all this meant that very early on in her uh, life, at the age of 16, she fell in love with a uh, man who was some years older than she was, uh, a relative of theirs, and she insisted on being married to him. Uh, they did marry, even though that marriage uh, broke up after three years. Um, in the three years that she was married, in her early 20s, she wrote and published three books of poetry, uh, Asir, Divan, and, Os Divan and Osian, that is captive, Wall and Rebellion. Uh, and the, after the, the marriage was dissolved, uh, as, it, as it was custom in Iran and it still is, the custody of the child was given, the only child, Kamyar, was given to the father. And she suffered all through her life, her very brief, lamentably brief life, uh, from not being uh, connected with uh, her son. Uh, even though there's no evidence for us to think that the husband was a violent man, or he, 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 in fact, he was a very decent person, but it just was, she was so much running into the normative society that Iran was and is today, uh, where everything has got to have its own norm, and you have to be a good, proper girl, a good, proper woman, a good, proper married woman, and so on and so forth. And in fact, um, Looking back on her life in her poetry, she does lament not opting the other way. That is, not opting uh, to have a proper marriage, uh, to live with her uh, husband, even though they may not have been in love, because the 
prevailing idea was that love will grow after marriage. Uh, the husband and wife will get to love one another afterwards. It was not like love and marriage and then uh, something else. So uh, she gradually either was or developed, and I'm not uh, versed enough in, in, in uh, medicine to diagnose that, but uh, she suffered from bipolar uh, disorder. Uh, she went through phases of manic activity and depressive moods, and some of her, her poetry shows that. My prime reference for this particular aspect of her poetry, which is little known because, again, at that time, uh, you know, all mental disorders were hush-hush. Uh, the, the, I think the most expressive poem there is Vahm Sabz, or Green Illusion, uh, in which the opening lines run something like this. تمام روز در آینه گریه می کردم بهار پنجرم را به وهم سبز درختان سپرده بود تنم به پیله تنهایم نمی گنجید و یعصم از سبوری روحم بزرگتر شده بود And so uh, it's, it's really a poem, a beautiful poem in which she uh, ponders whether it would not have been better for her to uh, be married and to uh, settle into the domesticity uh, and all kinds of images of domesticity uh, prevail in that poem. And in the end, this accusing um, voice that I think it's her imaginary uh, accumulation of thousands of years of patriarchy uh, says, Whereas by any standards, she, my God, she, she progressed, uh, in fact, uh, in a quantum way. Anyway, uh, it was in 1958 when she... Uh, ran into Ibrahim Golestan and began uh, working with him, uh, first as his secretary, then as, as assistant, and, and as you see in this film, uh, being given the difficult task, in fact, of, uh, of, of directing this film, uh, in which, as you said again in your introduction, and very aptly, uh, you said that the ugliness is just a surface thing. Scratch that surface and you'll get to it the depth of humanity that all of us share. And I can think of no other work of art in the world other than uh, Picasso's Guernica. Uh, how that village scene, those, those emasculated human beings and animals and all of that are there, are there to tell us everything about 1936 Spain. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, it is that kind of a, uh, creating the a hidden beauty into every kind of surface ugliness. Uh, she did also, uh, and you may, may or may not know this, but uh, she did play in some uh, works, for example, Pierandello's Six Characters in Search of an Author, mm -hmm. um, and some other works, but the greatest international accomplishment of hers was uh, the win in 1963 of uh, the Oberhausen First Prize in o Oberhausen Festival uh, for uh, The House is Black, which uh, as the years and decades have piled up. It has become only more and more famous, and I'm delighted to see this restored. I really didn't know what restoration was. Now I see. <laughs> Thank you very much for doing this. And so uh, now, 50-some years after her death, as one voice, and I don't think I'm the only voice there in uh, historical perspective in Persian poetry, I think she is unique. She is unique in many ways and in, in, in not strictly uh, poeticizing ways, but poetic imagination. She rivals great voices like Hafez and Nezami. Uh, and so I think she, hers is a completely lyrical imagination that works on everything. She went through three stages in life, stage of personal involvement with herself, then social involvement with the, the situation of women in Iran, and finally stepping into this vast, mysterious unknown that somehow connects with, with, with the whole tradition of mis mysticism in Persian, which I hope we'll have time to speak of. But that's, that's really a, a recapping of her career. Um, I mean, just, just to briefly note, in terms of the recovery of her career and its recognition, the New York Times has done a series of uh, uh, um, obituaries of on women, uh, professional women, artists, uh, important women who, who they did not publish at the time of their death. And, they, and one of the first women they chose was Farouk Farouk Saad to republish her obituary. Um, she died in a car crash in 1967, tragically young. 
Suzanne, I'm assuming you came to her poetry first, then saw The House is Black. Can you, f can you talk a little bit about how you first encountered her poetry and what it meant to you at the time? I um, encountered uh, Farouk's work in, in Iran because she actually, at that point, when I was in high school, she actually had entered the literary studies. So we actually studied Farouk's poetry. Which, and every time Farouk's name came up, there was this pregnant silence in the air. Um, and as young women, we were wondering what was the, what was the enigma. And um, on one hand, there was like incredible amount of interest in her life as a person. On the other hand, there was so many taboos around her. Mm -hmm. But what we saw was uh, a literary figure who wrote poetry that was so naked that for us in our teens, her um, tormented, dark, um, humanistic, modernist, um, existentialist, socialist, uh, fashionable, handsome, this combination of things was really attractive and interesting because, you know, it was in the time that we were all um, had high hopes for modernization in a way that didn't homo homogenize the culture in the sense of like there was this tension between modernism, westernism, and easternism, and this tension as where the balance is and how far we can go to become, uh, you know, sort of lose the identity of our culture and how how to also educate the traditionalists that you know it's not because we are experimenting that we are you know breaking the boundaries of what classicism or traditionalism is and how if we we actually are trying to um, rape our own complex and extremely interesting culture. So in this combination of uh, elements, um, Farouk was really for us like a, um, a someone to look, look, look up to. And also, it also kind of taught us that, you know, to do something progressive and interesting and personal individualistic as a woman that in a patriotic society, um, that you constantly, you had, you had to develop a way of fastening your seat belts and kind of going through life with that idea that there was nothing normal about the idea of being um, eloquent, modern. And it's like it was centuries had passed by and then we had maybe only 100 years of documentation of what women did in literature, in art, and you wonder, where were the women when we had Rumi and Hafiz and Attar? I mean, I mean, uh, matriarchy for sure is a genetic uh, psyche of Iranian women. We could see what Iranian women are doing now under so much pressure. Amazing. So you were wondering, how come we don't have any documentation of all that happened in those thousands of centuries? Then you would ask, oh, there was this mystic woman who danced naked in the 10th century. Her name is what, Lala, and it was like, that only one mystic woman who danced naked? <laughs> so there was this idea, the clarity of the fact that there was something wrong with this picture. And for us who, I was a ballet dancer in Iran. I was at that point in the arts. And so we had one foot in culture. I went to a difficult high school, so we had to really study. Um, the fabric of the society was really complex. And to have someone like Farouk there who um, had paid a really expensive price just to be a, a woman, just to be a woman in her teens. She had wrote a, a poem called Sin, which, you know, when, when I did my multimedia show based on her work, which was at the Wallace Annenberg at Royston, and then we took it to uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in the Egyptian wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. We took Farouk's words there and performed it there. Um, when... Uh, I lost my line of thought, but um, sin. Oh, yes, yeah. I was, uh, the multimedia show that I did called um, House is Black Media Stage Production was a, a combination of bringing all aspects of Furu's life, from her interviews, from her um, prose, the things she had written uh, for her um, diaries, her poetry, her uh, interaction with the husband, the, the lover, Ibrahim Golestan, who was a you know, huge, huge influence in her life. And so this uh, poem, Sin, was, had a very important um, 
road because that poem literally destroyed her life and custody of her child and they accused her about all kinds of things. So I actually was uh, going through translations of that poem in English and I read the poem and I said, well, what's, what's the big deal about this? She's like, ah, you know, I kind of threw my body in a pair of voluptuous heated arm of a lover. It's like, yeah, right, you know, in this context, in English. But when I, when I read it in Farsi, and I was working with Robert Egan, who's one of the best theater directors in, uh, in the US, and we were trying to work on the character, suddenly saying it in Farsi would give me goosebumps because suddenly it was like the context was گناه کردم گناهی پرز لذت در آغوشی که گرم آتشین بود گناه کردم میان بازوانی که داغ و کینجو یا آتشین بود wow. like in her time that much heat was obviously like wow so I decided to do the poem in Farsi just because I wanted to carry that vibration of being feeling that intensity of speaking with that blunt, naked language. But frankly, I mean, at 18, I mean, of course you're uh, promiscuous, you know, everybody is. Uh, so, um, so much to talk about. Yeah. Well, I was, I was gonna go back, and, uh, you know, so you talked a little bit about the body, I mean, the, the figure of the lover in her poetry, which I'm, I'm not as familiar with as I'd like to be. I've been reading your translations, which were really, I don't know what I know, but they're the best translations I've read so far in terms of getting, in English, the, uh, what you're describing, I can hear it, feel it from the books you loan me. Um, but the body, the lover, the intertwining physically, spiritually, is something that the imagery of the body occurs a lot in her films, men and women. The House is Black is obviously a film very much about the body, but a different kind of body, a body that is, is in a way been um, corrupted, um, at least in the initial encounter with the imagery. Where do we situate The House is Black? And you've touched on it a little bit, Ahmad. Where do we situate The House is Black in her, this is a question for both of you, in her poetry? And, and were you shocked when you first saw it? Not because of the images, but because of what you knew about her poetry. And then you saw her translating that into this visual medium. I was shocked at the, the fact that she did a d documentary on this scale mm -hmm. of the, 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 the poetic lyricism, the truth telling, the, uh, this metaphoric society that's deprived from anything and not based on anything that they should merit but based on injustices of the universe and also also a metaphor for how little we take care of uh, uh, the weak. Um, but I wasn't surprised uh, of the content. I mean the content reflects to me her huge tendency to be a um, human humanist, uh, women's right activist, a, uh, an existentialist and really wanting both uh, Furuk and Ibrahim Goristan really wanting to mirror uh, through their work to put a mirror before the society as to the darknesses that we carry and we never talk about to 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 have you reflect upon our own weaknesses our own shortcomings our own tendency so that you would reflect upon uh, the, uh, the the metaphors in, in the society mm -hmm. yeah to me the house is black really connects with several important uh, junctures in her poetic career, short as it was, 16 years only. But consider the, the question of uh, nakedness that, that, that uh, Susan mentions. Uh, she, she, she bears herself in her poetry as well. من اوریانم 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 مثل کلاسکوت میان کلام های محبت اوریانم و زخم های من همه از عشق است از عشق 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 من این جزیره سرگردان را از انقلاب کوه و انفجار اقیانوس گذر دادم و تکه تکه شدن راز آن وجود متحدی بود که از حقیر ترین ذره هایش آفتاب به دنیا آمد uh, the, the, This passage that I just recited really is an amazing display of of, of uh, if not spiritual, at least non-physical nakedness. Sukut miyane kalam hai mahabat. And I imagine that when she was given the, uh, the, the task of uh, filming uh, this, this leper's colony outside of Tabriz, she must have looked through that, those, those, those uh, scars as as something akin to clothes. And this, there's this 
mysterious idea in Persian mysticism that the clothing we wear is just to hide our own shortcomings. Mm -hmm. So the most per perfect of us are the most naked of us, if not literally, at least mm -hmm. spiritually and metaphorically. And as such, in some of her poems, when she stands in front of her lover, and she says, She's talking about everything in the body, but, in such a way that's so very different from her predecessor, Iraj Mirza, which puts us to shame if we want to, if we want to read her, uh, recite his poetry. She, in other words, without negating actual literal nakedness, elevates it. And this, I think, is where her poetry connects with, with uh, this film. The, the narrative that goes with the film reminds me very much of her own poem, Ayahaya Zamini, Terrestrial Verses, in which you see an end of the world, apocalypse kind of thing. And only few poets have done that. Lord Byron, in the dark, uh, talks about the end of the world. And when you imagine, in, or, or, or let's say in, in the Song of Songs, or in, in the book of the Ecclesiastes, those places are the places of the ultimate reckoning with our humanity and with the end of life. So I think what we are seeing here is how beautiful we can all be, perhaps as beautiful as the child who says, uh, the sun, the moon, uh, flowers, and play. It's like an amazing, uh, nakedness wrapped in the innocence of childhood. So I think it's, she really makes, maybe she did not, she was not even conscious of how the film related to, she was, she was doing something for someone, for her boss, uh, Ibrahim Golestan. But in doing it, she breaks all the bonds there and, and, and elevates herself, poetry and film, and relies on all of the previous uh, expressions of, uh, of, of, of that elevation in the tradition to m make a work that later, I think, inspires Kya, someone like Kya Rostami. Mm -hmm. I think without that film and without that kind of an elevation or, or as Freud would say, a sublimation, we would not have had a Kya Rostami or his expression of love as, as silence, as deep as silence mm -hmm. and, and, and not as shallow as speech all the time. So I think it's, there's a line in Persian artistic traditions that goes through verbosity to visuality. Mm -hmm. And so I think the verbal, when the verbal becomes visual, this is the best kind of it that we can see. You'd mentioned that Ibrahim Golestan was her boss. This was an assignment that came to his production company and he assigned it to her. But he they, was obviously much more than her boss and he worked for her and with her. Yes, of course, they were lovers um, and they also had a profound in influence on each other as artists. Um, Ahmad, you had mentioned earlier, I think yeah. that he was making documentaries up until this period of time, and Brick and Mirror is his first feature film, but it, from what you were saying earlier, it almost feels like the poetic realism that we see in her film, you see all over Brick and Mirror. I mean, it's almost like sh that short film inspired him to move into this other direction, but when her, when her book of poetry, After Birth, came out, after they had started you know, their affair, there, I mean, his influence was read into her work. It, there, it was basically, the, there was, as I understand it, everyone felt that like, well, this work is so radical, it must have been his influence on her as opposed to her doing, so can you talk a little bit about the, both of you, their relationship and how it, how they influence each other as sure. artists, but then also how it was perceived by the world outside? Sure. Uh, habitually, I shrink before the word influence because it seems, seems like doing something to someone right. and not with someone. So I, let's call it interaction. And I think it was really an interaction of several levels. Of course, they were lovers, sure. So much the better for them. Uh, but we're not going to knock that. <laughs> I, I, I think what they were, they were sources of inspiration for one another. And so I think taken according to those standards, I kind of tend to give an A to Golestan, but an A plus to Farouk uh, you know, being being the uh, the teacher that I am, so uh, it's 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 like it's it's like uh, she uh, she did so much through her art that was available to him and still is, even though she's he's very old now. He too did things, of course, 
and made things possible. Let's say, for example, the legend has it that he read T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland to her and, and to go, or the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock and, 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 and translated it for her. And, and we do see traces of the imagery there. But the whole that she made of it in a long poem like Dawn of the, the Cold Season really is an amazing feat where she has premonitions of her own death. You know, the, the poem begins by in manam zani tanha dar ibtidai dar aghaz fasl sar dar ibtidai dar ke hasti alude zamin and ends in that the spring to come and all the growth and blossoming and all of that so i think in that sense maybe we can compare that premonition to let's say shelley's uh, premonition of his death in lake geneva so it, it's 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 a very uh, involved thing but she definitely sees on what golestan had given her, then he sees on what she had given, and this may be a kind of you know latter day trace of uh, trace of uh, the patriarchy in in the Persian culture. But she proved more 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 of a student uh, and more of a learner from what Golestan had to offer than he was uh, to looking at her poetry. But whatever it is, it's I don't like to see it as influence, but I like to see it as the kind of close relationship that they had together yeah, was mutually I beneficial. I mean, really, it's a mutual because mm -hmm. uh, in relationship, I mean, Farouk had come from such a hard few years after the custody of, uh, lost the custody of her child, went back home. The father and mother were not into having like a wild daughter, and so she left. Yeah. She started working with a uh, with a friend on, on, a, on a theater piece, Khanum mm -hmm. right. So. And so she had come from a place of being completely an outcast from every walk of life. And she goes to Europe, studies editing, comes back to Iran, and a friend introduces her to Ibrahim Golestan, and she starts working for him as a secretary, and then they develop this, develop this um, romance. But what was, you know, what happened is that this uh, relationship, well, the lover being lovers and everything, but it, there was a certain level of museship that really made her grow wings. I mean, I think that Farouk, Ibrahim Golestan was independent financially. He was a hardcore intellectual. He was, uh, he is, uh, and then he also w had very little patience for idiocy. Yes. And because he was very independent, he could just be like, cut the shit out kind of a person. Mm -hmm. And so for Farouk, who had been like, just thrown out of every corner, finding someone who not only understood her journey, uh, just to go for it. It's cool. Yeah. Just go for it. And I mean, the value of that, you know, in, 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 especially when you're young and you're questioning every aspect of your own artistic trip that has cost you so much to have someone of that maturity and financial independence and also cl intellectual clarity to be in the picture. I think that, and she was this most inspiring young woman. So, I mean, what she did for him. I don't think that Ibrahim Golestan was as ambitious about her, his own art. I mean, I think he was producing a lot. And Farouk was more of, a, of an artist who really wanted to transcend. And Ibrahim Golestan was already doing what he was doing. So he wasn't eager to, in an interview I listened to him, he said, I have absolutely no interest in being famous or, um, you know. And um, so there were different dynamics. And I think they yeah. really, um, it's really a big mistake to create this idea that you know there was any competition or yeah. it's just not for Ibrahim Golestan's wife and family, but for them it was lucky they found each other. Something yeah. really wonderful happened. And no, really, because I actually know the family, some of the family members. I'm really good friends, and I can imagine. But you could imagine the fabric of the society was modern enough that they lived in the same street. I mean, Farouk and Ibrahim and the wife and in yeah. family, they also, well, okay, whatever, you know? So uh, it's, it, it's surprising, you know, where, where things were at. And, and then, um, no, I think that uh, the intensity was there, but muse was also there. Farouk was very unhappy not being independent uh, financially. And, uh, you know, they had these socialistic ideas about, oh, don't, you know, we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do that. And then in a party, Farouk was super mod and dressed and they were having yeah. these revolutionary ideas and somebody said, hey, look at you. You look like you just came out of some kind of a, you know, fashion. <laughs> what, you, what, what you say, Susan, about the mutuality of this muse uh, business, 
uh, I think it's so much more evident in Farrokhzad's poetry than it is in Gulistan's work. Uh, the two masnavis that she has in uh, in Tabalu Digar, uh, Ashikane and Murdab, uh, one one really exemplifies her uh, manic phase. Uh, it's an amazing work that really responds both to Ibrahim Golestan and way through centuries to Attar's uh, uh, and it's in the same rhyme and meter. It's it's a wonderful example of Shere uh, No not being really no at all, but being no in deep down and in connecting in a new way to the tradition of Persian poetry. I don't see that trace in Golestan's work. Mm -hmm. Golestan moves at his own pace, and he, you're right, he's, he's really the, the diehard intellectual that he is, and he remains so. You're right, while, while he's still, you know, from, from a very, uh, very uh, uh, comfortable uh, background, uh, background yeah. and uh, class of society, he still, Revels in his best work probably is uh, Asrari Ganja Dari Jenni, which is a satire on, on this political situation and the, the oil wealth that Iran won in the 1970s. Uh, but Farrukhzad did not write for the moment. Farrukhzad wrote for future generations. Farrukhzad is and a poet, yeah. and uh, Ibrahim Golistan is, is a... Um, is a provocateur. Uh, I mean, he's influenced on Iranian documentary films and a way of thinking, like a philosophical new wave kind of uh, person, a, 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 a thinker. And Farouk was a poet. And that was really what was different about him, that Ibrahim uh, had a uh, poetic vision, but he was more, more mostly sociopolitically oriented. Mm -hmm. He really was part of the communist, he was part of a two-day, and then, you know, the, he had different preoccupations, and Farouk was fundamentally a, a poet. Whatever she did, whether she did House is Black or whatever else, it was the, the, the life and the work of a poet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and then we were discussing this notion of tradition and modernity, mm -hmm. which, um, has been there through, throughout time. And, and you know, I mean, how many artists like Jackson Pollock, you know, Stravinsky, all these people who had that kind of innovation, that kind of talent, who died in poverty and they were outcasts. And so it's not, uh, I mean, our society, our culture, because we have a magnificent ancient culture and it's very complex, admirable. And, and uh, you know, you could, you could lose a lifetime just digging into our own culture. but. There is a generation that you know feels like I carry that in my genes, but uh, is a there's a different tendency. Mm -hmm. So this heavy-handedness of loving tradition instead of dealing with traditionalists who think they hold the hostage, or the, the culture hostage, and think that actually culture, let's say tradition, how was it you know created? It was created at some point in time by a human. That human probably was hung, <laughs> or like, because they were like innovating an existing mode, and they kind of shook the the boat and created something new. And this idea that tradition is something that you have to gravitate towards and stay there. For example, Furu, she wrote, she ended up completely writing in a free form, abstract way towards the end of her writing, which is the most interesting part of her writing. But she could any day write a ghazal. Mm -hmm. She could, I work with a poem uh, by Farouk called Osyan Khoda, mm -hmm. uh, Rebellious God. It's truly like a medieval poem. I, I, I still can't believe she wrote that poem. It's so multiple pages, completely like the metaphors, the language, this notion of rhyming. So this idea of, um, modernity and traditionalism in ancient culture. I mean, one can write a book about that because it, it's mm -hmm. so interesting to talk Books about it. Books have been it. written about that, yeah. It's so, so interesting to talk about it, but you know, you have to contextualize because you make a lot of people upset mm -hmm. as soon as you talk about, oh, oh you mean you want to westernize or homogenize the culture and we're all going to become the same, the globe is going to become, no, 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 not at all, not at all. I mean, I think Japan is a really good example of in the 70s, what they did with, their incredible tradition, the incredible, incredible tapestry of tradition and modernizing it at the same time. And 
entering the global sensibility and culture. I mean, one of the one of the we have to wrap up soon, so I have one more question for you, Suzanne. But you know, it is interesting to me that um, these films are now restored, and hopefully they'll get to play more because it does feel like maybe a missing piece of Iranian cinema has now been put back into the, the puzzle. And we can, and it's a turning point. It's a turning point from a traditional industry to something more modern that's embracing European art cinema and other sorts of influences, but within a very Iranian context. So I think these two films will get more play around the world and really help us complete a sort of contemporary picture. So we've talked a little bit about influence, the fear of influence. Let's just use the word inspiration. Um, you're, the four installation pieces that we showed here were part of a much larger work, the House is Black project, that very much foregrounds Farouk Farrakhsad as an influence or at least an inspiration for you. Can you talk a bit about the larger piece, the House is Black project and the exhibition of um, um, uh, Dawn of the Cold Season and um, how you've, uh, I don't know, is, what's the right word for it? Built, built on, evolved from, I mean, Farouk's work, yeah. I have to be very fast because I want everybody to have fresh eyes for um, yeah. for Ibrahim Golistan's film. I'm so happy to see this film. Um, fast forward from my teens that I was in, completely in love with Furu. Uh, I left Iran in 1976 and then uh, 1979 to New York. Revolution happened and we just never went back. So 10 years ago I moved to LA and suddenly for I work in film so I was composing some vocal music for a Hollywood film. So I arrived here and uh, I realized that there are close to a million Iranians in this city. And I'm like completely like culture shocked and yet there's this incredible alchemy of your own blood, your own culture. And I really wanted to connect with the community but I'm out of practice with what that means and in terms of, you know, maybe maybe you come in and do some kind of a 1970s nostalgic concert based on like whatever it is, millions of people show up, but like something that it raises us together, both of us, me as an artist, bringing my work and my experience to my community and the community who has, has not seen something that is a multimedia stage production, abstract minded, the whole thing that I really have studied in New York and I've been surrounded by people who created that kind of art form. So we, went to the Farhang Foundation and said, knock, knock, nobody else is gonna care about this. Could you help me? And they did, and then I met Christy Edmonds, some very, very interesting visionary uh, curators, and we created this piece around Furu's life and work. But I think Furu's work is synergistic, one foot in visuals, one foot in uh, you know, poetry, one foot in, foot in uh, social content, political content. Uh, so we had to create an art form that um, was an extension of her sensibilities and, and the synergy of uh, work that she did. I worked, I was a ballet dancer in Iran and then I was an actor, then I was a multimedia person, I, I'm a composer. And it just felt like this is a really great meeting point between Furur and I to bring these different mediums on stage to express who she really was and also to express who I am at this point in time and create a, create a uh, package that uh, included both our journeys. Mm -hmm. And in a way that was, and it's very challenging to do a poetic journey on a, on a life of a poet. Um, it took four years and we finally did the piece. Um, so uh, we could say that this was like a conceptual opera because all the music is original music that I composed with my partner Richard Horowitz who's there here tonight, Richard, thank you. And um, the visuals, uh, the whole piece is like a, a, a tapestry of woven um, from visual component back to a theatrical component, back to the musical composition. So it's very difficult. I should have probably chosen like five, two, three minutes of the uh, visuals of the show and showed you the context, uh, a trailer for my performance. So, um, but it's just in New York avant-garde coming to LA. <laughs> well, the films themselves are beautiful, so thank you for sharing Thanks that with us. It's been a huge privilege and honor for me to work with both of you over the last, next several, last several months and to share the stage with you. Really, thank you so much for thank all of you your so time. Thank you so much, Paul. Yeah. Thank, thank, you. thank you. It's been really enlightening. Thank you.